No way, that's impossible. We're living together. You just need to sign the divorce papers. Good luck with your poor life. I stood there, dazed, holding the phone after the call was suddenly cut off. The lawyer couldn't help but burst out laughing. Olivia looked at the lawyer, confused. He was wiping tears with a handkerchief. My name is Karen and I am the CEO. I have been married to my husband, James, for three years. We don't have children. We're both so busy with work, often even on weekends, that we hardly find time for long talks. We mostly see each other in passing, so we try to sync our schedules for overseas trips during our long breaks. It's only once a year, but it's something we both really look forward to. When we got married, we decided to buy a condo on the upper floor of a Bay Area tower. It was a stretch financially, but we thought about the future value of the property. Thanks to that, we're happy with our current life. I have a close friend from high school, Olivia. We sometimes grab lunch together. Olivia is beautiful and has high standards for men. She's not married yet but is eager to be. She looks for well-educated, high-earning men on dating apps and won't compromise on their income. One day, I was having lunch with Olivia at a cafe near a park. We went to high school and university together, even shared the same classes. That's why we've consulted each other about various things over the years knowing quite a bit about each other's dating histories and types. During our student days, we shared both fun and sad times. Those are cherished memories now. Since marrying James three years ago, we've both gotten busier, and the chances to meet have decreased. Now, we only see each other a few times a year. I'll come visit your condo next time, Olivia suddenly said. She'd never been to my place before. Then, on the weekend, she came over. I could tell she was amazed, even through the intercom at the entrance. As soon as I opened the door, Olivia looked impressed. Wow, this place is like a mansion, and that elevator ride was so long. I had chosen a spacious upper floor condo because it was a once-in-a-lifetime purchase. It's even more spacious than a house. It's beautiful, really incredible, Olivia said as she looked around the condo turning her head in every direction. Great location and an upper floor in a high rise like this must have cost a fortune, Olivia remarked with a sly smile. Yeah, you could say it's a million dollar condominium. It's got great security too, I said, but Olivia cut me off, reacting only to the term million dollar condominium. It must be over a million. Your husband must be making a lot, she said, her eyes wide with astonishment. That was so typical of Olivia. She always had high standards for men, especially regarding their income. James's salary is quite good for his age, I guess, I said vaguely. I felt it was tacky to be too explicit. Olivia had a look that seemed to hint at some ulterior motive. Can I use your bathroom? She asked and left the living room. I directed her to the bathroom and then started preparing tea in the kitchen. I was concerned when Olivia took a while to come back. I was about to check on her when she returned, saying, just replying to an email. Olivia usually didn't make excuses like that, so I felt a slight sense of unease. While enjoying the cookies Olivia brought as a gift and having tea, she asked, can I stay till the evening? She apparently wanted to greet James. It had been since our wedding that Olivia last saw James so it wasn't unnatural for her to want to see him. I decided to check with James just in case. James was happy about it. I might finish work early, he replied in an email. I told Olivia it was okay, and then I started preparing dinner. Olivia was using her smartphone, but then she stood up and went to the bathroom again. I didn't notice while cooking, but Olivia was gone for quite a while. When she came back, she was wearing a familiar necklace. It was my necklace. As I stared at the necklace, Olivia gave an embarrassed smile. How do I look? Does it suit me? She posed like a model. Seeing my stunned expression, Olivia started laughing. Oh, come on, I'm just kidding. I found it and thought it was cute. It must have been super expensive, right? A premium piece for sure, Olivia said, sounding like a child making an excuse for a mistake. That's a gift for James, 
Wow, he must be really wealthy to afford something like this. Olivia sighed, but more importantly, that necklace was stored in the closet in the bedroom. It seemed like Olivia had pretended to go to the bathroom and instead went to the bedroom to peek into the closet. I couldn't believe her actions. However, I didn't want to seem petty, so I just emphasized that it was a precious item. Taking advantage of my mild reaction, Olivia made a surprising request. Can I borrow this necklace for a while? I've got a date with a doctor I met on a dating app. I want to wear it for that. Please, she pleaded, putting her hands together as if praying. Reluctantly, I decided to lend it to her. All right, but take good care of it. Like I said earlier, it's a gift for James. As soon as Olivia knew she could borrow it, she smiled and started touching the necklace gently. Of course, I understand, she said, though she seemed to ignore my words. When I finished preparing the meal, I pretended to go to the bathroom to check the bedroom. Sure enough, the closet in the bedroom and the chest beside the bed weren't fully closed. Olivia must have opened every drawer and door she could find. There were fingerprints on the jewelry, watches, and precious metals. She might have touched things but probably didn't intend to borrow them. The shoes seemed to have been tried on, and the heels were bent out of shape. This was clearly going too far. I went back to the living room and asked Olivia, You touched various things in the bedroom, didn't you? The shoes are out of shape, and there are fingerprints on the watch. Olivia puffed out her cheeks a bit instead of looking sorry. Please don't do that again, I told her. Olivia went back to her normal face and said, Sorry. I didn't want to make a big deal out of it and risk hurting our friendship so I just laughed it off lightly. That's when James came home. He was holding a box of cake. It was the first time James and Olivia had seen each other since our wedding. It was awkward at first, but they slowly started talking and by dinner, they were chatting like old friends. While I was cleaning the dishes, they were laughing together. My boss is terrible, right? James said, laughing. I envy James's team, Olivia added. James was smiling, his eyes crinkling with laughter. That's not true, he replied. I was a bit uncomfortable seeing Olivia touch James so casually, but I thought it was better than them being distant. After all, James wasn't usually the type of man Olivia went out with. About a month after Olivia's visit, I noticed a change in James. He spent more time on his smartphone, which he usually didn't do. He often seemed distracted when I spoke to him and asked me to repeat myself. He always took his phone with him, even to the bathroom. It was a noticeable change. I felt like I was becoming a sheeted-on wife. I thought about checking James's phone once, but I hesitated to even touch it. Our conversations at home became increasingly rare. James started working on weekends much more often. He was hardly ever at home on weekends. Originally, we barely saw each other on weekdays, but now we weren't seeing each other on weekends either. It felt like we were living separately, even though we were in the same house. Moreover, we started sleeping in separate bedrooms under the excuse of his tiredness. I was thinking about divorce or separation when I found divorce papers on the living room table. Upon closer inspection, James had already signed them, although I had suspected it actually seeing them still shocked me. With trembling hands, I called James. I just got home and saw this on the table. What does this mean? It means exactly what it looks like. I want a divorce, James replied. I pressed him for a real reason. I've fallen in love with someone else. It's not just an affair. I'm serious about it. It was clearly cheating. Then I heard a familiar female voice on the phone. It was Olivia. I'm dating James now. I even want to marry him, she said. Though I had suspected it, hearing it confirmed made my heart race and I broke out in a cold sweat. I fell for James the moment I saw him at your house. We exchanged contact details and started messaging. One thing led to another and here we are, Olivia explained. Her tone was harsh. Maybe this was her true nature. James says there's nothing left to discuss. Can you just sign the divorce papers and send them off? Olivia asked, 
I wanted to talk things over, so I asked her to tell James to come home. No way, we're living together now. You just need to sign the divorce papers. Good luck with your poor life, she replied, and then the call ended abruptly. I stood there, unable to move for a while. After that, sleepless nights continued for me. James didn't come home. I couldn't bring myself to touch the divorce papers. They just sat there untouched. Furthermore, Olivia kept sending me multiple photos of her and James together, flaunting her relationship. It seemed to be an intimate relationship, but this felt like harassment. My mental health deteriorated, my complexion worsened, and sometimes I'd become vacant even during the day. People around me became worried and strongly suggested I go to the hospital. I ended up being somewhat forcibly taken for treatment and started taking medication. I managed to find some peace and started to sleep again. I could somehow go to work, but then an unbelievable thing happened. When I returned from the hospital, something fell off in the room. Going to the bedroom and opening the closet, I found that bags and jewelry were missing. The count of jewelry and watches in the chest was off too. There was only one person who could have done this. Why would she do something like this? What had I ever done to her? My insomnia came back and I had more sleepless nights, barely getting through my days. During counseling at the hospital, when I mentioned the theft at home, I was strongly advised to consult a lawyer. I contacted the company's lawyer right away and set up an appointment. The lawyer asked me first, what would you like to do? I'll get a divorce. I want those two to face proper consequences. I answered immediately, surprising even myself. Just a little while ago, I was unsure what to do. I couldn't believe how easily those words came out of my mouth. Perhaps I really wanted to punish them after being tormented so unfairly. A week later, I received a message from Olivia. I had sent her a certified letter. Hey, what are you thinking, sending a certified letter to my workplace? Olivia sounded pretty angry, her voice filled with rage. You must have expected at least this much. Anyway, I'm leaving everything to my lawyer now. I hung up the phone. Olivia called several times after that, but I ignored all of them. Then James called. I had sent a certified letter to his parents' house. Apparently, his affair being exposed at home caused a huge uproar. I wanted to burst out laughing at his self-inflicted predicament, but managed to restrain myself. Feeling that leaving it all to the lawyer wouldn't be enough to calm my feelings, I decided to confront them both. I would denounce them thoroughly on the spot. The lawyer arranged the date and time, and we decided to have the discussion at the law office. A few days later, the two reluctantly showed up at the law office. I thought they would bring their own lawyer, but it seemed they came alone. Olivia stormed into the office, flinging the door open. James followed, looking uncomfortable. Finally, we meet, you coward, Olivia said, not hiding her anger at all. James tried to calm her down. You've been avoiding us all this time. Our wedding has been delayed because of you, Olivia said looking like she might throw her bag at me any moment. James was desperately trying to hold her back. As I watched them with a feeling of pity, the lawyer nodded at me. Please calm down. If any violence or abusive language occurs, we will immediately call the police, the lawyer said. The mention of the police made Olivia stiffen. With the lawyer's intervention, Olivia and James took their seats, becoming calmer. We sat across from each other at the office table, ready to start the discussion. James, you're seeking a divorce, correct? I asked. Olivia sat angrily while James slumped, looking defeated. We agree to the divorce. However, since your relationship is considered adultery, we will ask for alimony, I stated. James's face clouded over. I'll agree to the divorce, but once the alimony is paid, don't contact us ever, he said. I quietly nodded in agreement. Olivia looked displeased, maybe expecting more resistance from me. When the lawyer began discussing the alimony amount, Olivia snapped, I said any amount is fine. We have plenty of money. Olivia sat arrogantly with her arms crossed. The lawyer looked at her with interest, then said, Oh yes, didn't he tell you? 
James is the president of a jewelry company with a yearly revenue of $3 billion. James looked up frantically, trying to restrain Olivia's arm. Alimony for an affair is nothing to us. I'll even give a proper share of the property. Olivia continued excitedly, her face flushed. James tried hard to calm her down. Olivia shook off his hand and continued. You can barely make ends meet on your salary, right? She scoffed with a laugh. The lawyer burst into uncontrollable laughter. Olivia looked at him with a puzzled expression. The lawyer, wiping tears with a handkerchief, said, Actually, the president is Karen. Olivia was dumbstruck, her mouth hanging open. James hung his head, his body trembling slightly. James is just an ordinary employee with no position at Karen's company. I am Karen's corporate lawyer, I stated. Olivia started laughing loudly. What are you talking about? Are you really a lawyer? Can lawyers lie? She asked. The lawyer calmly replied, Why not ask James next to you if what I said is a lie? James, meanwhile, just bit his lip, looking down. Olivia, growing anxious, grabbed James's arms and began shaking him. You said you were the president of a $3 billion jewelry company. That's not a lie, right? James remained silent. He covered his face with his hands, uttering inaudible moans. Olivia, growing more desperate, gripped his arms tighter, repeatedly asking, Answer me, it's not a lie, right? James finally whispered in a raspy voice, I'm sorry. The room fell into a deep silence. Olivia's strength seemed to leave her body, and she let her hands that were gripping James fall limply. You said you were the president of a company making $3 billion a year, she muttered almost to herself. James's single apology had plunged Olivia into despair. She stood up, trembling. It's a lie, right? There's no way you're the president. Olivia pointed at me accusingly. Why didn't I know about this after all we've shared? I spoke to Olivia calmly as if guiding her. Just because we're close friends doesn't mean I tell you everything, especially since you were so fixated on money. I had no intention of telling you. I looked Olivia straight in the eyes without averting my gaze. Olivia seemed to lose all her energy and slumped down. Then that house, of course, the house is in my name, so James will be the one leaving, I continued. Olivia fell silent, and James continued to hold his head. James probably didn't want to come here. He knew this would happen. But if he didn't come here, things would be worse. It's hell either way for him now. James is left with nothing but hell waiting for him. The lawyer began to present the evidence. I had first gathered these photos of James and Olivia together. They were the photos she sent to my phone, now printed out. The lawyer placed a voice recorder on the table and played a recorded conversation. Why would you send something like this? I just wanted to share our happiness with you. Olivia's voice filled the room, while James seemed to be holding back tears. Hey, still clinging to the past. I want to divorce quickly. I know what you're clinging to. It's James's income. He's the president of a $3 billion jewelry company, right? You hid it because you thought I might take it, Olivia said, perhaps embarrassed, and covered her face with her hands. Hurry up and divorce and leave that condo. It'll be mine soon. Too bad James didn't come back to you. I'll give you as much alimony as you want. Poor thing, your aim was the money, not James. I'm speechless at how you've been deceived, James. James looked down tears spilling onto his pants. James and Olivia fell silent. Do you think this is over? What else is there, Olivia? You broke into the house when Karen wasn't there and stole several items, didn't you? The lawyer said calmly. James looked shocked, apparently unaware of this. Hey, what's this about stealing? Olivia bit her lower lip, her hands shaking. No, not me. I don't know anything, she said. The lawyer placed a tablet on the table and played a video. It showed Olivia sneaking into the bedroom, taking bags and jewelry, and stuffing them into her bag. Olivia stared wide-eyed at the footage. What is this? Why are you recording me? Isn't this illegal surveillance? She asked. James covered his face with his hands. Inside our house, we've always had security cameras. 
Why didn't you tell me that earlier? Who would think you'd break in to steal? I started to get a headache from their ridiculous argument. And you used my key without permission. I wanted those things. It's your fault for not buying them for me. One argued. They kept arguing, ignoring us and the lawyer and I could only watch in disbelief. Please save your arguments for later. Regarding this theft, we will be filing a police report, I said. Olivia seemed to panic at the mention of the police. The police? That's a bit much, isn't it? I just borrowed something from a friend, she protested. I never gave you permission to borrow anything, I replied calmly. Besides, you're not a friend, you were just a classmate. That's why I'm filing a police report. Olivia seemed to realize she was defeated, and her attitude turned gloomy. Don't say that. I'll pay for it. I'll make up for it. Just please don't call the police. Olivia started to kneel and apologize. I looked down at her and said coldly, You're going to compensate. The value of what you stole is more than your annual income. Are you sure about that? Olivia was speechless. And there's also the matter of the alimony. Olivia turned to James, pleading in a tearful voice. You'll pay, right? Even if you're not the president, you still earn well, right? James was silent, looking down. He can't pay it because he's about to be fired, I added. James looked up in surprise. That's right, since leaving the house, James has not shown up for work. Plus, with this commotion, there have been complaints from his boss, I explained. James looked like he might collapse on the floor. But there's still the property division, right? I'll pay with that, Olivia said, but that wasn't possible. Karen and James had a prenuptial agreement about property. You didn't hear anything from James, did you? He never told you the inconvenient truths, I said, looking at James with disdain. The lawyer placed the contract on the table. The agreement stated that if the marriage lasted less than five years, neither party could claim the other's property. Currently, they were in the three years of their marriage. Olivia tried to grab the document, as if to tear it up. You should handle that document carefully. It's a notarized deed, and you could be held legally accountable for damaging it, I warned her. At the mention of a crime, Olivia stopped. She then half-heartedly pleaded with James, James, you have savings, right? Use that to pay. James looked at Olivia with resentful eyes. What money? You always wanted sushi, steak, this, that. There's no way I have any savings left. It appeared he also had debts from questionable sources. Olivia's shoulders slumped. It was a pishable sight. The glamorous appearance that used to make men turn their heads was gone. This was the result of the seeds she had sown herself. The two sat looking haggard and lost, muttering, This wasn't supposed to happen, and what will I do now? I decided to leave the rest to the lawyer and stood up to leave. Olivia, money isn't something you steal from others. It's something you earn through effort. After that, the divorce went through smoothly. I sent all of James's belongings back to his parents. His parents kept apologizing to me and even sent a letter of apology. Olivia was interrogated by the police for illegal entry and theft. My police report led to an investigation, and Olivia was arrested after admitting her guilt. Half of the stolen items had been sold, but I got the rest back. Despite the maliciousness of her actions, her show of remorse and intent to compensate suggested she might receive a suspended sentence. However, Olivia had other crimes. It was revealed that she had been stealing from men she met on a dating app, which meant she would likely face a prison sentence. No wonder she reacted so strongly to the mention of police and crime. James couldn't live in Olivia's apartment and moved to a two-apartment on the outskirts of town. He's looking for a job, but his unexplained absences and poor attitude at his last job make it hard for him to get hired. For now, he's getting by with day labor. After the divorce, I threw myself into my work. Now, I'm expanding our company's jewelry line to Europe. The idea came after a trip to Europe that I took as a break from everything. During that trip, I had the chance to share a glass of wine with the owner of a jewelry store in Switzerland. We talked passionately about jewelry designs. 
The owner and I hit it off, and he agreed to showcase my company's jewelry in his store. The owner is a wonderful man who, perhaps because of his own history with divorce, understands my heart act. To be honest, I'm focusing on sales in Switzerland, partly to see him. It might be mixing business with pleasure, but I think I've earned this perk after all I've been through. That's how tough it has been for me. I receive regular updates on their situations from the lawyer after the divorce. Jessica saw you at the restaurant bar, planning a trip with another woman. Oh, I see. So what? Even when caught cheating, my husband Brian wouldn't drop his defiant attitude. In that moment, everything we had built over 17 years fell apart. In this day and age, I was a full-time homemaker, and we were living with his parents. Just like every other year, I had given up the job I loved at a publishing company where I felt fulfilled. Now, I spent half of the week taking my parents to the hospital and adjusting meals according to everyone's schedule. I was living a life much like a housemaid after getting married. I had no time for myself. The only place I could relax was in our bedroom, even in this spacious house. Despite all this, I had chosen this life because I wanted to be with my husband. The option of leaving never crossed my mind. So when my unfaithful husband said, we can get a divorce, you know, I was at a loss for words, feeling more amazed than angry. This is the story of me, Nickel Ritchie, turning 45 this year, leaving my husband Brian, with whom I lived for 17 years, and starting my life from scratch. It all started three months ago on the 23rd. That day was payday for him, who worked at an electronics manufacturer. Usually, his salary would be deposited into our joint account. I would use that money to pay our monthly bills and give him an allowance in the evening. However, three months ago, his salary wasn't deposited into our joint account. I thought there must have been some technical glitch, so when he got home in the evening, I asked him about it. What do you mean you changed the deposit account without saying anything to me? He had switched the account to his personal one. But what about our payments? These bills are due on the 25th. I couldn't keep up with the sudden change and just thought of the immediate concern. Without thinking, he said, just let me know how much you need and I'll transfer that amount into the joint account. He said this while taking off his suit with his back turned to me. He wouldn't even look me in the eyes. So why did you change it? I couldn't think of any reason for this. In the 17 years we'd been together, we had never changed the account. We were saving in our joint account, so it wouldn't be a problem if his transfer was late. It's not like our bills would fall behind. Maybe I didn't need to press the issue, but I couldn't help wondering. Why didn't he trust me with our finances? Did I do something wrong? I didn't remember overspending, but I thought maybe I had unknowingly upset him. If so, I needed to apologize. That's what I thought when I asked him, but he seemed to think I was blaming him. He threw his freshly removed shirt onto the couch and glared at me. It's my hard-earned money, isn't it? Yes, it is. But why do I need your permission to use it? I couldn't understand his words. I'd been giving him a $800 allowance every month, but that was just a temporary arrangement. If his expenses piled up, I would give him more. I asked him what he spent his money on, but I never refused to give him more when he needed it. As a stay-at-home wife, there were times when I asked if I could buy something I wanted, but the reverse never happened. I don't need dinner today. But I already prepared it. Never mind, I'll eat out. He got bent out of shape, grabbed his car keys, and went out again. He had seemed strange for the past 17 years, but we never had issues over money. Suddenly, he starts saying it's his money. While cleaning up the food I had prepared, I was upset at my husband's selfish actions. I was frustrated that, despite having food at home, he chose to eat out anyway. Now he was in charge of the finances. From that moment, he began eating out every night and coming home late at night after I fell asleep. Also, the number of days he told me he was staying at work overnight increased. The fight had completely escalated. Even when we were together, we didn't talk more than necessary. As time passed, it was hard to find a chance to make up, 
and I started blaming myself. We'd never had a fight last this long before. It was a minor issue that he changed the bank account without consulting me. If he wants to manage the finances, that's fine. After about three weeks of awkwardness, I began to reconsider things. Then one day, I received a message from Jessica, who is my colleague. When I worked as a publisher, my colleague Jessica reached out to me. Hey, how are you doing? How about lunch soon? We used to go out for drinks after work and spend our days off together when we were single. Now, we both have families, so we don't contact each other as much. But we try to meet at least once or twice a year. Her invitation came at a good time so I agreed readily. Three days later in the afternoon, she and I were sitting in a cafe in the next town. So they moved into the care facility, huh? Yeah, both of them in the same place, I replied. She asked how things were going, and I told her about my parents-in-law moving into a nursing home a few months ago. I know I shouldn't say this, but it's a good thing. It must be a relief for you, she said, looking pleased. She had been worried about me because I never had time for myself, so it seemed she was relieved now. Well, I do have to get their clothes, visit, and accompany them to their doctor's appointments, but still my life has become a lot easier. This was the first time since I was single that I was able to casually make time to meet with a friend. You're such a dutiful daughter-in-law, is Brian still hands-off? Yes, he seems to want to do nothing on his days off. He never wanted to go anywhere on his days off. In these 17 years, we've never even gone shopping together. Her husband is diligent. He picks her up in his car when it rains and sometimes even does the shopping for her. He never changed at all. Well, since I am a stay-at-home wife, at least he could take care of his own parents. She has never thought highly of my husband. We both had jobs when we got married, but he never helped with the household chores. There were days when I was too tired to do housework. He found it unbelievable and suggested I become a stay-at-home wife. I didn't want to quit, but I resigned as he suggested and became a full-time homemaker. Soon, I was asked to live with his parents, and I ended up taking care of them. The reason I couldn't talk back to my husband was because of the significant difference in our incomes. He is seven years older than me. By that time, he already held a position at his company, and his income was more than double mine. Can you earn as much as I do? If you can, I wouldn't mind quitting, he'd say, making me speechless. I discussed my true desires of not wanting to quit my job with her. I even cried on the phone overwhelmed by having no time for myself. I understand if she holds a negative view of him because of my venting. After a while, the warm vegetable salad we ordered arrived. As she served it on smaller plates, she asked again, so how are things with him? I thought for a while and nodded affirmatively. I'd actually come to discuss our big fight, but I didn't want him to be seen in a worse light. Jessica paused, holding the serving tongs and staring at me, who only managed to nod in response. Trying to keep my smile to not arouse suspicion, she stopped serving the salad midway. I'm sorry, I asked it the wrong way. Nickel, things aren't going well with him, are they? She said, as if she knew something. I was left flustered and unable to respond. She started talking about something that had happened a few days ago. That day, she was at a dining bar near her office for a work after party. When she went to use the restroom, she passed a man in the aisle who turned out to be my husband. He didn't seem to recognize her, so she decided against calling out to him. But noticing that he was in casual clothes made her wonder if he was with me. After leaving the restroom, she decided to take a look at where he was seated. She saw him having drinks with a woman who wasn't me. Then I realized instantly he's cheating on you, she said. They were sitting close together, bodies touching as they drank. Was that really my husband? I couldn't believe it. That day, he hadn't come home due to working overtime, so there was no reason for him to be in casual clothes. Moreover, he seemed genuinely busy lately. 
Does he even have the time for cheating in his current state? Although we've been on bad terms recently, I can't imagine him resorting to cheating. I just don't see him as that kind of person. Sensing my thoughts, she sighed and added, for the upcoming long weekend, he mentioned going to a place in Laguna Beach. He was showing information about the accommodations on his phone and mentioned something about a prime-grade steak dinner. You could probably find the hotel if you search from there. She started searching for the hotel on her phone. While at the cafe, I was still hoping that it was just her misunderstanding. However, as soon as I got home, I started looking through his clothes. I don't remember exactly how many clothes he has, so I wouldn't know what was missing. But I did notice that three or four of his favorite shirts were gone. Until last year, he would immediately wear them after washing, and they were always at the front of the drawer. Now, they were nowhere to be found. Even after searching every corner, the back of the closet, and the drawers of rarely used cabinets. Literally everywhere. The only thing that came to mind was him working overtime, and even on weekends, due to his busy schedule. I remembered the look on his face when he told me he had spent a night in the company's restroom because he missed the last train. As I stood in front of the closet, I heard the sound of an incoming email from my pocket. It was a message from Jessica. The email included the URL of a hotel in Laguna Beach. As I stood there in a daze, I slowly pressed the link, and a stay plan with a dinner, including prime-grade meat, was displayed. I felt dizzy, like I was having a bad dream. There was a part of me that still wanted to believe in him, but I couldn't find his favorite shirt. That was a huge blow. Three days later, on the Saturday before a long weekend, he was unusually at home, working with the TV on. I placed a cup of coffee near his computer and casually asked, you know, I haven't seen you wearing your favorite t-shirt this year. Even though he hadn't taken his eyes off the display, when I put down his drink, the sound of him typing on the keyboard suddenly stopped at my question. Then he said, yeah, I'll wear it sometime, making a point of looking at me as he responded. That was unusual. For the past month since that payday, he had been distant, but now, when asked about his shirt, he was making eye contact. I looked for it, but I couldn't find it, I added. He replied, isn't it somewhere, and then looked away, returning to his computer. Seeing his reaction, I couldn't help but feel suspicious. Despite saying his favorite shirt was missing, he showed no signs of being troubled. Normally, in this kind of situation, he would pretend to be upset just to make a point that I hadn't taken care of it properly, even if he really didn't need it. Last year, he kept complaining just because it hadn't dried due to the rain. Every bit of change made everything seem suspicious. When it comes to this, I can't control myself. I need clear answers, often pushing too far. You're off for a long weekend, right? Even though we hadn't made up after our last fight, I couldn't help but ask something more intrusive. Work from when? I don't know, there's a business trip, I might have a day off. Was this also a lie? I could only think it was. For the past 17 years, he always took time off during the holidays. Jessica's words about going to Laguna Beach and the prime grade steak crossed my mind. The story I heard at the cafe started to feel real and I felt a surge of anger. Before I realized it, I said, business trip? You mean you're going to Laguna Beach? He froze while staring at the screen. Slowly turning around, his expression changed. With a weary face, he squinted and glared at me, just like during our fight on payday. What the hell is going on? Rummaging around our room, pretending to look for clothes, he sighed heavily. Hearing his words, my lips quivered. I had rummaged through the room but found nothing. I couldn't find the t-shirt. Yet he said I had rummaged, which means if I had looked more, I might have found something linked to Laguna Beach. I still wanted to believe, even while doubting. Jessica said she saw you at the wine bar. You and another woman were planning a trip. The things we had built started to crumble. Oh, is that so? I thought he would make an excuse, but reality was different. He wasn't flustered at all. He turned away with a defiant look. 
So what's the point? He questioned. What did he want to hear? When I became speechless out of disbelief, he piled on words. Who do you think you are? I'm working hard to earn money so a stay-at-home wife can live comfortably. He yelled loudly and my head started to ache. I placed a hand on my forehead and took a deep breath. I'm okay with getting a divorce, you know, he uttered. For the past 17 years, no matter what happened, no matter how hard it was, I had tried not to think about it. I was disappointed that he could say it without hesitation. From that day, he continued to ignore me. Even worse, once he knew I found out, he started making plans with her right in front of me, like, all right, I'll pick you up at seven in the morning. The first time it happened, I was dumbfounded. Was he always like this? The person in front of me felt like a total stranger. Then, the long weekend arrived, and on the day of his trip, I was in the car driven by Jessica, silently watching him cheat. Nicole, did you get a shot of him putting his arm around her waist just now? Yeah, I did. You should take as many photos as you can, okay? When I told her about my conversation with him on Saturday, she was furious and said I should break up with such a man. She also suggested that I take photos as proof of his cheating and claim for emotional damages. She spent her much-anticipated weekend for this very purpose. The woman he was cheating with looked to be in her late 25s or early 30s, slim and wearing revealing clothes. He kept stroking her long hair with a gentle smile on his face. Since he left the house, I'd also left promptly and watched everything. I saw him pick her up from her apartment, stop by a convenience store to buy breakfast together, and walk arm in arm in front of the splash zone and penguins. Now, they had just entered a hotel together. I took pictures of all of it with my phone, but each time I pressed the shutter, I pondered over what I was doing. I knew it, but seeing it with my own eyes made me really sad. Yet, I didn't shed a tear, I just stared at his joyful face. What do we do now? Shall we stay somewhere for the night? Jessica asked. No, let's head back, I replied. She seemed to plan to stay overnight, but I shook my head. I didn't want to waste money I had saved by scripting on such a thing. I thought our life as a couple had finally started after my in-laws were placed in a nursing home. We hadn't been able to go on trips until now because we always took care of our parents first. But from now on, we wanted to create memories as a couple. The money I had planned to use for those times seemed wasted. I wondered if I had just wasted 17 years. If I knew it would turn out like this, I wouldn't have married him. If I knew I would go through this, I would have divorced him a long time ago. I shouldn't have had to endure and try so hard. Seeing his smile today for the first time in a while made me want to redo those 17 years. Though I wanted to cry, I couldn't and just kept sighing. Jessica had been quietly listening but suddenly started the car engine and checked the time. What time is it now? After four o'clock, I replied. Then she called someone and smiled at me. Hey, Nickel, let's move out right now. Huh? Ah, hello? Sorry to bother you during the long weekend. I appreciate your help. I was taken aback by her sudden proposal. She was about to start something, and I shook my head at her while she was on the phone, but she ignored me and went on saying it's all good. From that moment, Jessica was very energetic. While driving, she called various places on her car's navigation system and gathered people to come to my house. About five hours later, we got home in the evening. In just two hours, all my belongings in the house were packed into cardboard boxes. It was literally unbelievable. I didn't want to talk about work since you didn't want to quit, Nickel, but I've transferred from a fashion magazine and now am the editor-in-chief of a local magazine. In the car, she made various calls to the moving company, a real estate agency, and also to a lawyer who knows Brian. She had expertly adjusted the schedule so that the service people's visiting times did not clash. I moved according to her instructions. Minute by minute, I packed only my valuables into a box, and the rest were done by the movers. 
The real estate agent introduced me to a house that could be moved into within a few days. For the time being, my belongings were sent to her house and I ended up staying with her for a few days. After the truck packed with my things left, a lawyer visited me. They gave me advice about things like claiming alimony after divorce, guiding me towards a method that would be the least burdensome. I was amazed at how much could be done in just a few hours. I knew she was a very active person from when we used to work together, but her ability struck me as incredible. However, looking around the room that was now half empty, anxiety slowly began to creep in. He's definitely going to be mad. The cost of moving was surprisingly low. The studio apartment was affordable, and even the consultation with the lawyer was free. Yet, it was still costing money. I made these moves without telling him, so I'm sure he'll be furious when he gets back from his trip. As I felt our relationship falling apart, I became depressed. Jessica slapped my back and said, Hey, being a homemaker is a respectable job too. The money you've saved from being frugal is also yours. Plus, it's his fault. He said he'd transfer the necessary money, right? So let's have him pay even for the cost of living on your own. After being strongly persuaded by her, I took one last look around the house. I remembered how hard it was to rearrange things in the early days. Now I realized I had put my toner on the bathroom vanity without hesitation, and the shoe rack was filled with my shoes. I had always seen myself as a maid, but maybe I had actually become part of the family. Imprinting the image of the home I had lived in for 17 years in my mind, I nodded vigorously at her. Then, on the last day of the long weekend, I left the house I had shared with him. I was still staying at Jessica's place when he called. I picked up with a trembling hand. Where are you? He asked with a grumpy voice. Without answering his question, I said the words Jessica and I had decided on beforehand. You said you were okay with a divorce, right? And that you would transfer the necessary money. I am divorcing you. Please provide for the cost of me living alone. What? Stop talking nonsense and come back. He seemed to think this was just a runaway. I cut off his voice and spoke my final words. Please have your new partner take care of your parents from now on. Thank you for 17 years. While he was still talking, I hung up. He called back several times, but I didn't pick up. I felt guilty about ending things unilaterally like this. But looking back, I had always accepted his one-sided demands ever since we got married. So I tried to think it was fine, at least in this last moment. The following year was a whirlwind. I negotiated with him through a lawyer and finally got a divorce with a limony and living expenses assured. I had no peace of mind until I found a job, but I've been working as an office clerk at a local factory and slowly buying what I need with my monthly salary. Nicole, can you make the deadline this month? Yeah, I'll make it, but I think I'm going to barely make it by the deadline. I don't have time to chat on the phone. All right, all right, I'll go now. You have your piece this month too. Five months ago, Jessica, who manages our local magazine, added a new section about saving money. As a frugal person, I've been given the chance to write a couple of pages there every month. I had given up my dream to work in a publishing company, so her arrangements mean a lot to me now. I'm a writer, and I have 17 years of experience in budgeting as a homemaker, which I want to share wholeheartedly. I was able to make a fresh start, but then an unexpected call came in. It's good to hear your voice sounding well. Mother-in-law? My mother-in-law called me from her nursing home. I had said my goodbyes to her before my divorce, but I hadn't contacted her since then, so I was surprised she called. After talking about my father-in-law's advanced dementia, she updated me on my ex-husband's situation. What? He broke up? Yes, that's the case. He's foolish, isn't he? He was dumped before the divorce was finalized. I see. Seems like his relationship with that woman has already ended. Well, that's expected, isn't it? Any young girl would run if she had to deal with taking care of seniors. So who is at the home now? Brian. He ended up leaving his big corporate job, 
but he's trying, with his complaints, he's such a fool. He was able to work because of his wife supporting him behind. He still doesn't talk about his own infidelity. Nickel, breaking up with him was the right thing to do. My ex-husband hasn't changed, but it seems like he's struggling a bit. I found myself a bit relieved by hearing that. My usually stern mother-in-law chuckled and said, Nickel, thank you. I was planning to ask you to try again with him when I called, but your voice sounds so lively, so I decided not to ask. In the roughly 17 years we lived together, I never had such a long conversation with my mother-in-law. Our relationship wasn't bad, but it wasn't good either. I listened to her voice, assuming this would be the last time I'd hear from her, and I savored every word. It turned out for the best, she said sadly, and my tears welled up. It's been a year since my divorce. Everything has been going well, and I've managed to make a fresh start. However, I've always felt a lingering sense of regret. It's because I felt like I had wasted 17 years of my life. But then, with this phone call, my mother-in-law said thank you, and that she had planned to ask me to try again with her son. There's no chance of getting back together with my ex-husband, but hearing that from his mother made me genuinely happy. It felt like a validation of what I had done for those 17 years. I will never forget this phone call from her. Those 17 years were not wasted because now I believe that.